Hello, everyone, and welcome to the View World Tour. We are hosting it here in um, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I have Simone and Sebrin with me, and we are going to be presenting a few talks today. Uh, I am so thankful to this dot labs for reaching out. This is super amazing and exciting. We are super happy to be part of it. Um, we're going to go over sort of our regular Atlanta view JS meetup stuff that we go through every single time. Uh, first off, uh, we do have a code of contact, uh, and we want to make sure that we have a harassment free environment, uh, both for people who are participating as well as our speakers and anybody involved. Um, if you'd like more information about our code of conduct, please go to Atlanta view and you can find out more there. Um, once again, a big thank you to this dot labs, uh, for, uh, hosting, uh, this event. We're super glad and happy to be part of this. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all that I have at this point. Um, so yeah, Simone, uh, Sebrin, welcome. Uh, we're going to go, uh, I'm going to give a quick talk first. And then I believe Sebrin is going to talk about what well, Sebrin, what are you going to talk about? I'm going to talk about using installing Jack Zach JS components uh, with Vue and Chakra Y Vue. Awesome. And uh, Simone, what are you going to cover? And I'm going to cover the the state of PWA in oh, uh, new environment. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, let me switch out slide decks here really fast, and we'll be good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and I will give my talk. It helps if I choose the right screen. All right, so hello, welcome. I'm Alex Revere. I'm uh, one of the co-organizers of the Atlanta Vue.js meetup. Uh, I'm also a co-host on the Enjoy the View podcast, um, and I'm a senior front-end developer for Traina Design. Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere as at Femian, Twitch, Twitter, GitHub, whatever. And my blog is at alex.party. But enough about me. Let's talk about define custom element. So I'm going to ask a question. Dear, dear watcher, have you ever wanted to just put a view component in one place on a page? Right? Like you, maybe you're using PHP or Python and you want to be able to use view but not have to do all of the like stuff and like you just want to put it in one place. And so to do that, you you go ahead, you start, you sort of like wrap your entire page and like in like a view wrapper so that you have like a way to like be able to put a component on a page. And then the JavaScript that you've already written, it sort of starts fighting with the view stuff and the view starts fighting with the JavaScript stuff. And so now you're like dealing with like weird things there or or maybe Maybe you're in the enterprise space. Maybe you are working with a micro front end situation. And so you are like wrapping up your um, thing and packaging it and like having to do like a very specific thing. And it's just, it's chaos, chaos everywhere. And you're tired of it and you want an easier way to do it. Or maybe, just maybe you're like me and you want to write a component library that other people can use. But maybe other people who don't use Vue Right? Maybe you want to write it in view, but write it for anybody to use. And you've maybe been hanging out the last few years and have heard something about like web components. And you're like, why can't I have web components? And why can't I have view at the same time? Well, introducing define custom element handy view three feature you probably aren't using. So let's talk about define custom element. This allows you to write view three components and uh, use them as a native custom element. Now, custom elements are the technical term for what we commonly refer to as web components. It allows you to have shadow DOM and uh, like scope styles and like all of this stuff just built into the browser, right? The browser will recognize it as an HTML element. And the benefit of this is that it does allow you to use it with other front end frameworks. Now, I'm not going to go on a huge tirade about like all the various 
ways that web components work. I'm going to talk specifically about define custom element and using this in view. So in order to do that, we do need to look at some examples. So let's look at the basic syntax of how this works. Now, our basic syntax is going to start off with getting define custom element from view. Uh, this is a view three thing. It is built into view three. It actually, with view 3.2, you can just do this like it's there available to you magically uh you then will bring in your component you can write your component right there if you want to but it's probably better to define it as a single file component and then bring that in and then to actually make our custom element you use custom elements dot define which is on the window object this is this is the browser part this is the magic this is the way that we say hey browser I'm going to make a custom HTML element, and then we tell it what that custom HTML element is called. In this case, it's my dash component. Now, when you make a named component, like when you make a named custom element, it does need a dash in the name. Any single one word in HTML is reserved, and so you have to add a dash to make it two words. And then to actually give it the custom element itself, we wrap our component in define custom element. And now we have an HTML tag that we can just use anywhere on the page. And we get all the benefits of like using view from doing this. Now, this example doesn't actually show anything. This is just syntactic, right? This is just me showing the syntax. So let's actually do something fun with it. Now, I have borrowed this example from Alex Trost over on front end horse and, um, Alex is, uh, he made a hot dog thing. Uh, so you can put a hot dog on a page if you want to. So we're going to do that. We're going to do that with a custom element. So this is just styling pretty much, right? It doesn't functionally do anything. So let's look at this example. So as you can see at the top here, I'm bringing in define custom element again, um, as our first line. And then I'm using it to make an element. Now, the naming convention I like to use here is calling whatever the thing is an element. So in this case, we have hot dog element. And this sort of mimics the um, way that HTML elements are named. For instance, you have HTML input element, HTML div element, HTML span element, right? You have all of these elements that extend an HTML element. So we're saying this is also an element. Now, I need this to have a couple of attributes that are useful to us. So I'm defining them here. We have ketchup and mustard, uh, and that's all I'm going to do with those. We also have our template, which is a slot. Now, slots in cu define custom element work differently than slots in view. In slots in view, you sort of get like all of the stuff that's in the slot into the component itself, and you can start like querying it and playing with it and doing things with it. Um, in custom elements, slot is actually an HTML element. It is it is an actual HTML element. There is a, there is an actual thing in the DOM called a slot, and the browser knows to render things in that spot, but you don't have access to them without doing some extra stuff. So it doesn't work quite the same. And because of that, the caveat here is that you cannot use scoped slots. Scope slots do not use, work with custom elements from view. Very important to remember later. But for now, just know the slot element is a thing and you can't use scope slots. Uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is styles. So styles is a new property for our component. Uh, it doesn't do anything for a normal view component. But when you're talking about custom elements, this is the way that view knows, hey, these are the styles that need to be injected into our shadow DOM. Um, and so when you write styles in here, they are scoped to the component. They are only available in that component natively in the browser, right? So it actually adds an extra style tag inside of the shadow DOM and allows us to write styles that way. And because of that, we're able to write some interesting looking styles. For instance, this one, this is the host selector. So the host selector allows us to select the element itself, the thing that is on the page and say, this is how you should style that element, right? Typically those elements just start off as like a, a 
span essentially i think they're like an inline or maybe they're a block but they're they're just sort of like nebulously there they don't look like anything they have no like information or in interesting look to them so we're adding some extra s spice and pizzazz to it but also we said uh, our hot dog remember this is a hot dog component our hot dog can have mustard uh, so here's our mustard definition. Now you'll notice I am using, uh, parentheses since the host selector, uh, is actually like a pseudo element. We have to like say, here's the attribute that we want on it. So when you're wanting to choose attributes based on attributes, this is how you would do it. Similarly, if you want to use like class, you would do host open paren dot whatever close paren. And you can like have like light mode, dark mode or whatever classes you want that way so with our mustard attribute here we want it to have a wavy yellow line and with our ketchup attribute here we want it to have a wavy red line and then we define our custom element which is going to be hot dog uh, with our hot dog element and so here's the actual demo of it uh, and you can see over here in my code pen, we have our hot dog element over here, which is great. Um, and, and over here, you can see it's actually looking like a hot dog. And we have our ketchup and we have our mustard. Um, so yeah, that is, that is one way that you can do this, right? It's self-contained, all of the styles are in there. This is a pretty tame example though. So let's recap, make sure I didn't forget anything. So with our style example, there's the new styles property that allows you to add styles to the shadow DOM. Now, it's kind of awkward to write styles in like an array with strings inside of your component. And so if you are writing a view single file component, if you add the extension .ce.view, so .ce for custom element .view, you can, with Vite and with view loader for Webpack, you can, uh, write a style block and it will automatically get added into your um, styles array. They'll just automatically put it in there. Vite will know, oh, you're making a custom element here. Let me just do that for you. Um, then the other thing to that we sort of talked about briefly is scope slots don't work. Now, because scope slots don't work, we still need to be able to pass data between components, right? You want to be able to get data from like a parent component to a child component. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. My favorite, which I have an entire talk about, and we're just going to sort of not explain how that works right now, because that's a whole talk in and of itself, is provide and inject. Provide and inject is the perfect thing to use here, and it works works out of the box you just write a view component with provide and inject and you can turn it into a web component and you get all the benefit of it so let's take in let's look at an example of this so the example that we have is an accordion so i'm sure most people watching this have at least used an accordion or something that is similar to an accordion pattern where you will um choose uh, you click on a thing and it opens and then you click on a different thing and the first thing closes and the second thing opens, right? And so here it is, right? If we look at it over here, you can see, uh, like, I click on things and they open, right? So there's some state that's being tracked here, right? We need to track which one is open currently and we need a way to be able to, like, uh, toggle things based on whether or not the thing is supposed to be open. So we actually have four components that make this accordion work. So the first component is our accordion wrapper and it just tracks the current state right it tracks um what uh is currently open right so which index is the active one we have our section which tracks the identity of a section right so it's just it's it's got an id now both of these are providing those values down to the children so with provide and inject you can provide a value and with inject you can use it as long as that component is a child of whatever is above it, right? So, so in or child, grandchild, however deep you need to go. So, a title has an a an a an anchor tag in it, an a tag in it, and that will um, very easily uh, inject the values of our ID from our section up here, right? and inject the current thing that's open. And when you click on the title, it will set our current index from accordion wrapper to the ID of the current section. 
And because we are setting the current ID, our content, which also gets both of those values injected, will check to see if it is active, if the current ID matches the current value of our accordion wrapper. And so when you click on something, like if this is zero, I can click on that, and then this is one, so I click on that, and now our current index is one, so it opens. Uh, same thing here. And I have not styled these at all in the component itself. All of the styling that you're seeing here is actually from SAS. I'm, I'm writing some CSS that just is globally available. It's just available. And because of that, you can see here, I'm using a special, some special keywords. I've got part, which allows us to style things inside the Shadow DOM. So this is a way that you can write CSS outside of the Shadow DOM to style things in the Shadow DOM. And uh, it will reach in there, style the thing that you want. Now, part works like class does. You add an attribute called part, and it does part equal, and then you can write in however many words that you want to separated by spaces, and it will know like, oh, okay, I know what that is. Um, and so to use it, you then say col colon colon part parentheses name of the thing that you want. So in this case, it's link. I have another example down here with our content. So I have our content part, but then I want the expanded content part. And so I'm using two words separated by a space and it knows what to do with it. Uh, and it will style things correctly. And both of these are being styled from the outside. So I also have a sideways accordion wrapper here. And so I've just added a class to our accordion wrapper to turn it sideways. So now it's working left to right instead of top to bottom. So that is sort of the accordion example. Uh, so let's recap what I talked about very quickly, very messily right there, which is uh, you can use provide and inject to talk between components in, uh, in web, with web components, but you can also use an outside store. You could use Pinya, you could use Vuex, you just add it into the component and then now you have a global store. So for instance, if you were making an add to cart button and a cart icon, you could have both of those talking to each other through a global store that when you add to cart, it updates the back end and then gets a response and updates the cart icon and it all just works together, but you're not having to create view instances all over the place. It, the browser just knows what to do. Um, and then we can use the part attribute to style bits and pieces of the Shadow DOM for our custom element and um, be able to do things with it. So lastly, let's talk about good uses and not great uses. Good uses are shared components, right? We talked about component libraries, being able to like share it between multiple code bases. Web components, custom elements work with Svelte, React, Vue, Angular, right? Like all of them should be able to just like drop one in and use it. React is, but it does work. Um, MicroFriends is another great place. This way you're not having to be like, okay, start a view application here. You just be like, just put this element on the page and go, right? Um, also, if you're writing with a backend language where you're not like able to server side render some stuff and you want to be able to like add things to a page, uh, uh, but you need like view in like lots of weird different little places, this is a great use for that. This is a great way to do that. Now, what it's not good for is forms. We're just going to go ahead, get that one out of the way. It's not good for forms. Uh, forms and web components don't play nice at the moment. Thanks, Safari. Uh, and yeah. So uh, the other thing that it is not good at is scope slots. Uh, if you like using scope slots, you're out of luck. Uh, so yeah, that is my talk. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Alex. You, you know, I was like, I was taking notes actually. <laughs> So I'm going to do some homework later. Yeah, making this talk, I was like, oh no, I'm going to have to make an hour long talk out of this now. Oh, yeah. so. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Thank you so much. Great content. Uh, cool. All right. Well, I believe that Seabrin is up next. So, Seabrin, are you ready? Uh, yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> All right. So, I'm up next, and um, I'm really thankful for being here. It's uh, really cool. Um, I will be talking about uh, using and styling Jack G Zach GS components uh, with Chakra UI view. Um, so let me 
go to my slides real quick uh, so I can put on next. Okay, there we go. Um, this talk is just like 15 minutes long, so I try to jam as much uh, yeah info in it as possible. Um, but it is very much like uh, influenced by the talk uh, that Lazar did um, called Intro to Building uh, UI Machines with ZEG.js. Uh, Lazar is a um, core member of the Chakra UI React team. And um, yeah, his talk is really more in depth uh, on what is, uh, why they built ZEG.js, uh, why they used certain things like state machines, what are state machines, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He's really doing a great job explaining those things. Um, so if you want to watch that uh, talk, after we're done here, um, just scan your QR code to go to the link. Um, and um, my talk will be more like how to use it and, and more focused on the code side um, of JackGS and uh, in combination with Vue and Chakra Y Vue. So first uh, brings me to myself. I'm Sibren and I'm from Belgium. So a long way from Atlanta. Um, I'm a front-end developer at Ericom and um, I'm a core member of the Chakra Y Vue team and a part of the organizers of the Bellevue meetup group. Um, on Discord and Twitter and all the socials, you can find me on the Carweg if you have any questions or just want to reach out to a nice chat. Um, so, ZegJS, ZegJS uh, itself, let's start with that. Uh, what is ZegJS? So, Zeg is a collection of framework agnostic accessible UI components like an accordion, uh, a menu, a dialogue, a toggle button um, that are powered by state machines. Um, these are, th those are um, framework agnostic, so they can be used in React, Vue, uh, Solid, um, and whatever. Um, so real short, the state machine things, again, if you want more in-depth stuff, um, I would say go to the laser uh, laser stock, um, but real simple. This is, for example, a state machine, and it's a tool to modeling stateful reactive systems. Um, it's useful for describing the behavior of an application or a component, and um, yeah, it mainly has uh, a finite number of states. Uh, like this toggle button has an off and an on state, uh, and it has a finite number of transitions between those states. Um, so when the button is pressed, it will transition from the off to the on uh, state, for example. Um, so why use JackJS and why JackJS? Um, well, the the thing is that it is uh, powered by state machine, so it's really cool and um, easy to um, build complex components uh, real fast. Um, like I said, it is framework agnostic. Uh, so you can use the ZEG.js uh, components in every JS framework. Um, they just need a few things like, a, like an adapter, um, but ZEG.js also provides this. So yeah, you're good to go. Um, like with Chakra UI, um, they also focus on accessibility. Um, so it will come with all the needed keyboard uh, interactions, uh, focus management, area roles, and attributes, etc. cetera. Um, it's not styled. So it's completely unstyled and gives you all the control to use whatever styling solution you want to use. Um, in later on, I will be using Chakra UI for certain reasons. Um, and um, one last thing is that every component machine is a separate NPM package. So you can install them one by one. And like, if you want to, uh, let's say, upgrade uh, your existing existed exp uh, application uh, to use JackGS components, you can do them one by one. Um, so JackGS is created by the uh, yeah by some people of the Chakra Y team to solve some problems that we have with the different between the different framework uh, versions. Um, and um, this is also why you should use um, 
uh, ZEG.js. Uh, when you want to create your own design system or component library, um, ZEG.js will give you all the logic uh, out of the box, so you don't have to rewrite it um, yourself and so don't spend time on it. Um, and then you can just put on your own styling, your own brands on, on top of it. So real core, uh, short, um, Checker UI view. Um, Checker UI view is a component library um, with a little bit more styling than the ZEG.js component. Um, it also focuses on accessibility. So again, all the needed stuff is there. Um, the idea is that you spend less time coding and um, yeah, have more speed on building your um, UIs by using these uh, components. Um, Chakra UI view comes with an extendable teaming API, so you can make your application look the way you want it and make it feel and look the way you want it. Um, we're building currently our view one version, which is uh, view three compatible, um, but sadly it's still in alpha stage, um, but I will be using it in the code later. Um, so the code itself, uh, let's see. Uh, what we will be building is this super, uh, very easy accordion. So that's really great that Alex did uh, a great explanation of what an accordion is and how it works. Uh, so I don't have to go into there. Um, the state of, of everything is, is managed by the state machine. So you can just click open on this thing. Um, there's just some of, um, yeah, uh, popular beers in Belgium. Um, since I thought it would be interesting to give uh, or to, to have as uh, content. As you can see, it's totally not styled. So this is what you get out of the box um, from Jack.js. Um, so I can just like open stuff. Like I said, it comes with keyboard interaction to go uh, and press my key up or enter to open it. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah, how to use this. Uh, so we go to the ZEG.js uh, documentation, which is like, yeah, everything you need. Um, and here you can see that there are already a few um, frameworks that, is, that are, are supported. So React, Vue on the GSX uh, syntax or the uh, single file component syntax and uh, Solid. Um, one thing we need to do first is like um, thinking, hey, what uh, component machine do we need? Or uh, um, so we need the accordion. So we install that package. Um, and then we also will import everything from that package. Um, and then the other thing is, hey, what framework are we going to use? It's going to be Vue. So I take the um, ZJS slash Vue package. This is what I talked about um, before, this is the framework adapter. So that's um, everything we need to do, have JGS accordion working in a view application. Um, I started with a clean view, um, view, view project uh, with feet, view tree project. Um, so yeah, let's just show the code real quick. Uh, real quick. Um, as you can see, just a single file components. I'm going to use a single file components syntax with uh, the composition API. Um, here I have the ZEG.js accordion. I imported everything from it. And also the um, framework adapter um, will be importing a few things from there. Um, what are those things? Uh, the use machine It's going to be... Uh, here, we're using it here. Um, what is this? Uh, this is a function that you pass uh, the component machine into that you want to use and you get some certain stuff uh, from it that we need, like the state and the send. Uh, the send is, uh, no, first the state is like the current state of the, that the machine is in and the send uh, are set methods that um, progr programmatically changes the state. Um, then we use um, import the U setup. Um, the U setup is to set up the state machine components uh, with, with a few things like uh, the send methods and uh, a unique ID. So um, 
that every component has a unique ID um, or every accordion because behind the scenes, Jack.js will just add the one to accordion dash one or something. I don't know about um, by heart. Um, and then another thing that we import is normalized props. Normalized props converts the props that, uh, of the component uh, into the format that is compatible with view. It's needed uh, for view um, to make everything work. Um, and um, yeah, um, what, uh, what else do we need? This is just some content for the, air, um, the um, accordion. And um, the last thing you can see here is this computed property um, that uses the accordion uh, component machine uh, and the connect from it. Um, this is a function that translates the machine states uh, to GSX attributes and event handlers. So we can use it um, in our template. Um, the accordion.machine, well, that's the state machine logic for the accordion uh, component can also add uh, some extra properties into this. If you go back to the documentation, uh, you can see this. Um, here are some properties that we can have. So we can say, hey, we want possibility uh, that it's possible to open multiple uh, accordions, for example, that we just, uh, yeah, we'll pause it, uh, for example, say multiple true, um, just how we, yeah, some um, nice uh, customizations there. Um, and then inside our template, we will build our um, accordion. And um, like Alex uh, showed in his, uh, in his talk, the accordion has different parts. Um, so we have the content part that is the thing that will toggle open. Um, and we also have a button to trigger the open and close of the accordion. Um, yeah content. Uh, you, you notice that this is wrapped in an H3. This is because of area um, yeah, standards to follow those. Um, so yeah, that's everything we need for our uh, Zeg Accordion component. Um, and we can use it. So now, as you can see, there was no styling on it. So it looks really stupidly really boring. Uh, what we can do now is add check row. I'm just going to check out the new branch where I did this. Um, what do we need to do? Simply add a package that's called check row I view uh, next. And in our main.js, we have to tell view, hey, we want to use check row I view and yeah, add the check row I view plugin there. And then we're good to roll. Um, what we can do now is start styling this. Uh, like I said, check row by view comes with um, some components that we can style. For example, the chakra box, uh, which is a very basic component, just like a diff that we can style. Um, if you don't know chakra Y view or chakra Y, um, I don't have time to, to, to explain everything about it. Um, but um, yeah, you can just, find it uh, in the documentation there. Um, okay, so we style a few of those things with just um, the style props like BG for background and take say it wide, border width with one pixel, etc., etc. And then it's going to be look a very, yeah, it's going to be look better. It's going to look better. Um, what, what is another thing that we can do if you say like, hey, I don't like check row I, but please don't say that. Um, so you can say, um, you can style your, the, um, the accordion yourself, um, let's say with, uh, with this, um, and then if you go back a little, this is the last thing I will do, um, just to show you guys, um, every, every, uh, part of the accordion has a data part, uh, attribute, um. For example, the data part the content, and we can just like use that to um, to style and give it like a background color of red, and then if everything goes as planned, it's red. So that's really cool. Um, it's just how you can use and style JackGS components. Um, no, okay. Um, I'm going to have to like end my talk here. Um, so 
yeah, I hope it's be cool to uh, check out what's what's in Jack.js. There are a few components already listed in the documentation, but in the inside the code, there are a lot more components. Um, and uh, yeah, now you can use them in your next Vue.js project. Um, thank you for your time and uh, see you next time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. And that was super, super handy. I'm yeah. now I'm we're doing some design system stuff at work. And so I'm like, I'm like, oh, oh yeah. I need to oh, okay. I'm super yeah. excited. Yeah, it's the same thing for me. Uh, we're also doing I'm also doing some design uh, system stuff at work. So it's it's cool to see like, hey, I don't have to write the logic of an accordion myself. I can just use this. Yeah. And uh Put all the styling on it, like Tailwind or just SAS or whatever. Yeah. yeah. All think... right. Well, Simone, I believe that it is your turn. So, you ready? Indeed. I'm ready. Awesome. I'm ready. Let me handle myself out my own screen. Okay, work. Here we are. So um, thank you so much for um, you know for making me part of this as well. I always like to talk uh, to uh, this uh, these events and always be part of this. Not just for me for my own talk, but also to listen to your guys' talk. They were amazing. Um, as with the other two talks, uh, we're going to spend fifteen minutes today uh, discussing uh, state of PWA. Uh, this talk can actually be stretched all the way to one hour. So that means that we are really just going to touch upon this. And if you guys want to. Uh, you're more than happy to actually reach out uh, in Twitter and I'm more than happy to share the slides because there are a couple of uh, URLs and references that are very, uh, you know, very interesting to actually have and go through. Before we start, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Simone Cuomo and I'm a software architect, um, uh, software architect engineer at Distal Labs. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at zelly88880 where I'm actually the most active. Um, and I'm actually here today to talk about the PWA. There's not a lot of the view related PWA there. It's more of a generic talk. They just little input, but I am a, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, view is the, my, um, uh, my framework of choice and really love. And, you know, I mean, every view event that you can see around. So I do apologize if you don't want to see my face, but I'm there around. So the agenda today is going to be a quick introduction to PWA. Some people still don't know PWA and never used. So this may be a good introduction talk for you. And then we think about PWA in practice. We check the success story because people still think that PWA is not used, but they are actually used by a big, big company. And then we check what actually PWA can do today. And I'm 100% sure we're not going to reach the PWA in iOS. So that's, you know, I can put my magnet. But information on this, uh, these um, PowerPoints is very, very important for you to get access to it if you're interested. So the first part is, um, you know, introduction to PWA. If you were in the room now, I would actually ask you to put your hands up to see, you know, how many people have actually used PWA in production. How many people have actually done more than just that? that? And unfortunately, even if, we, even if it's been around for a long, a few years now, not many people actually use PWA and it's, and it's unlucky knowing how simple it actually is to set it up. So what actually is PWA? Um, from the Mozilla side, we can see the PWA are a web app um, that uses service workers and manifest and other web platform um, to actually give users an experience of on par for native, app, native apps. So in a nutshell, PWA are the missing, um, uh, the missing steps between a web application and native, uh, native application. Important to say, a big disclaimer, I'm not saying that PWA are going to replace every single application out there, that no more phone application, native application should be done. But there are a lot of native applications that people are forced to download that have nothing else than a static side or thing. So that's where PWA can really help. Um, what are the advantages of using the PWA? Someone will probably say. First and foremost, it's a smaller size. So we will see later with the success stories that uh, the compa comparing the actual application, like a, a native uh, iOS application or native um, uh, Android application, and comparing that with the PWA, it, you know, the size difference is huge. Um, you also, it, it also more accessible for small teams because you just need to program something one, in one technology. So HTML, CSS, you can use Vue, you can use React, you can use Angular, but you just do it once and it actually works on all devices. And also, you know, that's something that I, uh, that's one of the main reasons why I've, uh, I've used Vue and I started to use Vue is you remove the monopoly in the app stores. 
So at the moment, the app stores take a lot of money from the creator, from people that actually create it, uh, and it's kind of it's, it, it drives uh, you know who who, who, make, who is successful and who is not. So that gives the ability for more stores to be created and more to be created and to be more um, um, you know more um, competitive uh, you know I'd say uh, market around. Um, as I say, it helps small businesses because you know you need less people. You don't have to pay for uh, iOS and Android device, and also reduce the web traffic. Uh, that's an important thing. Again, if you go, uh, if you have a small businesses, it will actually uh, reduce the load on your servers. That is a very important thing. What are the cons? Well, um, it can be tricky to test um, unless if you don't know what you're doing and at the very start. And also, there can be some issues if you don't really understand how service worker can uh, does work. And that can turn, for example, a very something that can be seen or some people have encountered is issues with redirect. So there are things that the, you know the service worker will reply, even if you remove your site completely behind the scene. The service worker will reply and say, "Hey, don't worry, the site is still here, and the redirect will not work." So I know that that's something that maybe you've seen it or you've, you've encountered and, and, and removed you from using PWA. But this problem can be solved. Um, uh, we are going to cover in very few words. I'm going to say how to implement PWAs in a few different environments and what actually this implementation will do. Okay, so all the implementation that have always worked with and the one we're going to share today and many other that you see around are all powered by what is called Workbox. Okay, uh, Workbox is a set of libraries supported by Google that can power a product ready service worker. So if you go into work, work, if you search for Workbox on Google, um, there's a website where they show you all the different, um, you know, different features that they have and how they support you in using um, the service worker. You don't need to use it. You can go, from, you can start it from scratch, but that's a very uh, easy way for you to get started. Something else that you need to be aware that when you use Vite, uh, when you use uh, Vue, when you use implementation service worker, it, well, 100% of the time in the cases that I've seen, they use Workbox behind the scene, okay? Because it actually makes it very simple for you. Uh, as I mentioned, you can start with Workbox and then you can actually expand to more, more advanced user as, users as you go through. Um, the reason why I'm talking about Workbox is because that, that um, makes it so simple that you have no more excuses, okay? You'll see today how to set it up. You cannot say that it's too hard and there's absolutely no reason for you not to set up something. Uh, we're going to go and see three different examples on setting up a PWA in CLI, with so with the Vue CLI, with VIT and PWAs from scratch. What does setting up a PWA actually mean? Okay, so um, we're going to see later on in this talk that PWA and um, the features that are offered are so wide. Okay, there's so much stuff. But what they mean today, what they, what they usually encourage people to do is set up the very basic PWA. What the very basic PWA does will it will cache your static content. Okay, and we'll make sure that the a file that has already been accessed before will not be downloaded. So let's say, for example, you have a documentation site. Yeah, by just installing the PWA, as I'm going to show you now, that documentation site is actually going to um, uh, all the different files that a user may access. Yeah, so the main page, all the images, everything, the JavaScript, the Vue.js file that loaded behind the scene, they will be automatically be cached behind the scene. So if a user accesses that page again and is completely offline, they will still see the last site is in. The PWA will automatically handle updates. So what that means is that if you actually push a new version of the sites, when the user go on the site, that version will be downloaded. And there is different way of actually downloading it. So really, there's a no-brainer of doing it because it will save your server all the requests. It will make it very, very simple, quick to the user. And this is really what I mean by the basic um, example of a PWA. I'm not talking about telling people to download it on the screen, make the splash screen and do all the crazy things. I think even just a basic setup PWA will help a lot of people getting into it and also for people that want to use it in, in the native way by adding it to their own home screen. So let's see how to actually handle this in practice. Um, there's not going to be loads of coding because it's absolutely simple. Um, so the first and foremost, we use the Vue CLI. So you can go on the Vue CLI and there is a um, um, uh, if you go in the core plugins, there is PWA, so it's actually handled by the VC. There is um, actually a plugin with Vue CLI. So the first thing you do after you have installed Vue, so this example um, expects you to already have a Vue 2 application installed with the Vue CLI. The only thing you do, you do Vue add PWA. 
And then you have to configure a manifest, okay? So manifest is nothing else than a JSON file where you set some information. So as you can see here, I'm setting the name of the app, the theme color that is, um, um, you know, is, is the tile that is, is the screen, is the color that is going to be shown when the screen comes up. MS tile color, that is actually the tile that is going to show on a mobile phone uh, on the background. And there you go, uh, Apple mobile um, web app capable and Apple Apple mobile web app status style bar. So those are the, those are the basic that you actually have to set up for, for it to actually work on, on both iOS and, um, and Android. So just doing these two things, so the top one and the bottom one, what we'll actually do will actually ensure that when you actually build the application, so this is very important, okay? PWA 90% of the time will not work on a dev application because it requires HTTP server. Okay, so let me say when you run your NPM build, it will automatically create service work behind the scene. It will automatically take the file and say this file needs to be cached and everything will be handled for you. Okay, when I, when I said at the very start that it's actually complex to test, it's precisely the reason. This is actually the reason. Uh, you don't have the hot, uh, hot story load. Um, you don't have a, a very good environment, uh, dev environment at the moment because the PWA is not very simple to set up on local host and it requires a HTTP and a build setup to actually work. So, and that's, I think, is, a, is one of the biggest problem there. But if you actually make this very basic setup, there's no main changes in actually um, implementing it and actually have it as well. Um, if you actually see a, a bit implementation, it's absolutely, um, uh, it's actually the same, very, very similar. Uh, again, you can check the sites there on bit plugin, pwa.net and um, is um, again, also in this case, we are expecting a view application to be there. So you do install view plugin, and then as you can see, you um, you set up the plugin in the vit.config. Uh, what you can see that vit, vit pwa in the object, the object is the same manifest. You can add the information in the manifest, so you can add name and anything else. Um, I want to jump forward. So there are more resources, for example, the PWA Builder and other things that have been done, uh, been created, but as there is not much time, I want to jump forward on something that has really been cool to, uh, to see how to use this. First and foremost, success stories. Which company do you think have actually used it? Well, many companies. We go, uh, the biggest one is actually Starbucks and, and, and Twitter. Um, if you go through here, you can see that there's been a big, um, uh, you know, a big increase, a, 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 an absolutely immense um, uh, result. So as you can see, this is when I was saying about the, the, si the, the sizes. We go from 10 to 50 megabyte to just 150K. Twitter, very, very good upgrade. Um, Trivago, they had a 97 increase on, uh, on people actually clicking on, on the tile. And, and again, you can go over and over. So if you search around, people that have tried PWA and spent time investing in it, it actually had a good, a good uh, return. I do apologize that I'm running, but I want to go to the last resources. That is, um, um, you know, actually sharing what can we do with PWA, okay? Um, as I mentioned, people think that it's really just talks to the first step, yeah? So they think that that's all you can do with the PWA. But in reality, if you set up your site with the PWA, you can do way more. Um, I found this site while I was searching for, when I was getting this talk that is called what PWA can do dot today. Okay. It's so hard to say, even worse for me to write it. I always forget about it. Um, but this site is very, um, very interesting. So if you access this site with your, with your, um, uh, with your device, it will tell you precisely all the features that you can use on your device. For example, you can see here that I'm on a Windows machine now, so I could install it on my home screen if I click here. It shows you all the different features. So, guys, we got authentication, uh, we got audio recording, we got NFCs, uh, we got payment. So, all these are actually available. Now, remember that when we say to implement PWA and service work in this feature, we don't mean that you're actually going to force people to replace and add these things in their app. You can even just create a website where this feature enabled within the, with, you know, this feature enabled. Um, something, for example, let me see, what, what can I check? Uh, geolocation. I'm going to click on geolocation, if it works. It's not all for me. Oh, I think the site is there. Uh... Okay, geolocation, I don't have permission. So, okay, of course, this is permission level, as you can see, I stopped the permission for the geolocation. Let's go notification, let's see if it goes. What is nice about this as well, it tells you how the code is written, so you can actually see it. Um, the notification actually sent, but it sent on my other screen, so not another one to, to check. Um, 
authentication no, vibration no, because I don't have authentic vibration. Let me see what else. Uh, network information, again, you're able to see the speed, so you're able to probably provide different things, audio, file system, all these, it's available. OK, um, of course, some of the not all of this is available to all the screen, uh, all the, all the um, you know, all the browsers and all the mobile phones and everything else. But all this is actually happening. OK, um, I did a PWA app for a company uh, four and a half years ago and less than half of this was actually available or even in the making. OK. So what we have right here, guys, is, is a process of actually really, really browser trying to come out and trying to really support the usage of PWA. And I really hope that um, maybe with this talk, maybe with people coming in, maybe from the success stories that we uh, briefly touched, people will be able to actually understand and get this through. Another one is barcode attach. I never used it. Uh, but again, it's something else that um, that it will be done. For example, it doesn't support on my device, but it does on most all mobile phones. Um, again, uh, I'm a very. Uh, I know that the time is up, so I'm gonna uh, stop talking uh, right now. But um, it's, I'm a really, um, really supportive of PWA, and uh, not because I hate apps. There's nothing to do with it. It just I know that so many um, websites could really benefit from uh, from these features that are supported, um, it will really, really benefit uh, not only the person and the development team that is doing it, but even the end user will, will, will benefit from actually having things implemented this way. They will save on mobile data. They will have a better experience when they actually access the site, um, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a bus or in a shagged selection. And something else as well, you have to remember that not everyone has access to a very fast internet like we have. So I'm originally from Italy, so I go to Italy many times to the, on holiday on the south of Italy, and there is no connection. Like to load the page, it takes around two minutes. So when I actually can go on a page and the page is already preloaded and the only thing he has to do is fetch the new data, the difference in actually in loading time is absolutely met. So actually you may gain a lot of users and a lot and increase your business um, you know, um, extremely by actually implementing the PW. So I really hope this gets better next year. I'm not going to have to do this talk anymore. Um, and I thanks, I've, um, thanks both Alex um, for inviting me and Sibyl. And I'm going to invite you back in the stream. Yay. Woo. Woo. Done it. That's exciting. I, Sorry. I, I had not realized that there was that much stuff like available to PWAs now because I remember setting them up. You can even do touch ago. now. You can, yeah. So on a, on a mobile phone, you can actually do touch. So when you go on a site and say login with the touch, yes, it's all implemented. It's all supported. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. amazing. That's mm -hmm. super cool. Well, all right. So that's sort of it for the formal talks. Now I don't know how many people are actually in the chat for video at the for the video at the moment. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, yeah. Do y'all have like? Uh, do y'all have anything that you didn't cover that you want to just sort of like briefly? That you were like, you're like, oh wait, actually, there's a really important thing that we need. To... <laughs> well, well <laughs> let's say one that, hour later. <laughs> let's say that I may have um, uh, inadvertently uh, forgot to mention that the PW support on Safari on iOS it's awful, mm. but they've done it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the, 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 the slides will have a lot of content on that if people want to get it. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's the same thing with the with web component support. There's there's a bunch of things that web components can do that we're, we're kind of we're, we're waiting. We're we're politely waiting for Safari to. Oh, Internet Explorer is dead. Ah! Nothing, nothing. Yeah, the yeah, see <laughs> Safari comes around. In Internet Explorer is dead. Long live Internet Explorer. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I think that's everything that we have today. Uh, I am not seeing anything in the chat. I'm not seeing anybody asking any any questions in the ask chat. A question. You have a question? Yeah, I have two question. Uh, it's it's one for you, Alex. Okay. Um, so. I was thinking if I want to migrate from uh, migrate my application from let's say Angular, JS, yeah. let's make mm -hmm. it make it that uh, to view. Can I just start like using the custom elements created um, with view to like 
systematically change uh, yeah, the Angular components? That is a great question. I have no idea. Th and that's not from me. That's more of a, I don't know how Angular JS is doing things. Yep. Um, I know that, so I know that with React, there are issues with web components sometimes. Um, and there are some more caveats with define custom element. For instance, you have to like, if you want it to be able to have a class, right? You want it, the class attribute, you have to yeah. add that as a prop. And I think that there's a bug in there somewhere. I need to file a report about it. I was sort of running into that as I was making examples. Um, but it's a similar thing with, um, with like other frameworks as well is that there may be like little gotchas where they're like, like with Vue, if you want to use web components in Vue, then you have to like tell Vue, like, by the way, th when you see this, that's a web component. So <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one of those where it's like, sometimes if, if, if angular JS. Now that being said, like if Angular JS is just like I don't care, like sure, whatever, it's a tag, whatever, move on, right? It'll work. It'll just work. Um, there's not anything special that you have to do to like okay. use it or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I know that we started. I started doing it. Uh, we added a custom element to our website um, as like a as like an infinite scroll thing. Um, to get some text just to like infinitely scroll across the page. And uh, that was wrapped in jQuery. That broke some things uh, and I had to account for that. Um, so yeah, it's you run into weird edge cases like that mm -hmm. occasionally, but yeah, that's sort of my answer is that it depends. Yeah, always depends. Right? Yeah, always depends. Ah, cool. Yeah, um, give it a shot, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have an Angular JS application <laughs> though, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah. Another question, but it's more uh, about the OVO World Tour. Mm -hmm. How can I make it stop in Belgium? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so now it's in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come okay. over. To um, there is absolutely no problem. Uh, reach out uh, later on Twitter, and I'll uh, connect you to the the digital media site that would support you and actually moving to Belgium. And we can do it at a better time for me and you, Simon. So yeah. for people watching, it's around 9 p.m. for me and 10 p.m. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we do our, uh, you know, we work hard to make people happy around the community. So it'll be great. Let's do it at midnight uh, EST. There we go. No, you wouldn't like that. That'd be like first thing in the morning for y'all. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's not go too far. Let's not go too far. Yeah, you make it be a, a breakfast date for us on the a East Coast. So. That's yeah, high school. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. I will do that. Amazing. Awesome. Well, I think that's it for us then. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Simone and Sebrun, for coming and doing this. Thank you to uh, this dot for making this possible and making the view world tour possible and reaching out to us. We're once again, we're super excited to be a part of this and uh, we are so glad uh, that y'all are a part of this community and it's super great to have y'all here. So uh, thank you everybody. And I think that's it for us today. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.